CDC has finally released an update on how common or prevalent autism is in the US. And we're going to talk about this data. This is an update for the first time in five years, so we're a bit overdue. And I know what you might be thinking, oh, CDC, I know CDC took a hit in terms of um, its credibility amongst the population over the pandemic. I did an entire video series dedicated to that very topic based on certain government documents that analyzed why CDC lost public trust. So check that out. But nevertheless, it is the only organization that provides us this type of information. They released really nice report. So might as well go over it. My name is Dr. Mikhail Rashik of Merogenomics. Let's get going. First of all, let's talk about the autism spectrum disorder. They provide a really nice definition, very basic. So this is where children have social behavior issues. They have communication issues. They have certain risks. They have restricted interest and repetitive behaviors. Another element that can be you can uh, use to characterize char characterize ASD is that it is heterogeneous. It's a fancy term for saying that how the condition is presented can be extremely variable. So there's a great variety in terms of presented symptoms, in also very great variation in terms of the severity as well as the kind of support that a child might need in order to cope with with the condition that also brings me to my previous video i did on autism re reversal so check that out and the reason why i bring that up is because clearly there are certain environmental factors we still don't fully know what is going on. This is why I applaud the current Department of Health desire to really start investigating this in detail. And they claim that no stone will be unturned to determine as to what could be the, the factors as to why this might be happening. So that's really good. And, oh, excuse me, car coming. And, so there's that, there's clearly environmental factors, but also there is genetic factors. Now, and I've made a video on that in the past as well. The reason why I bring it up is because no, I'm not claiming that genetics cause autism, but genetics can contribute to that heterogeneity, the, this variation. And in the past, when I used to work with medical DNA testing before COVID pandemic, kill that component of business. I used to promote the idea of using genetic testing to determine exactly what might be happening there. The reason why that is of value is because it can help to determine how to manage a given condition. And I still stand by that. And if you're interested in that, let me know and I'll let you know which was my favorite company for doing this, this type of analysis. Now, the news is unfortunately not good because autism has increased, but let's go back to what was the last stats. So the last stats we had until now was from 2020, and we have this famous proclamation that one in 36 children had, uh, had autism. So as I mentioned, that was five years ago. Now, look back at my video about the autism reversal, which, by the way, is extremely rare to in terms of documentation in medically related scientific publications. So definitely very uncommon. And the reason why I think it's there's environmental factors contributing is because in terms of reversal that, that was achieved that I discussed in that video, I remember diet was one really big factor that, that was important in, in that situation. And Check out the video in terms of the historical chronology, how the rate of autism in the population has been increasing over the years. And it's just astonishing. Clearly, it's not just the fact that we have better diagnostic criteria. There has to be something else and we still don't fully grasping what is going on. But what did the CDC um, do? So they analyzed this information based on 16 centers around the United States. And they looked at eight-year-olds, see how many of the, of the eight-year-olds 
were diagnosed with uh, ASD and they also looked at four-year-olds for suspected autism spectrum disorder. Now, what does that mean? It, uh, it means that the child went through the evaluation process and did not get the diagnosis, but it was left in the record that suspected ASD, uh, it was suspected that they might have ASD, they just did not meet all the criteria in order to obtain the diagnosis. So they also looked at, looked at that information. And we're going to look at four types of information that this article from CDC provided us with. So we're going to, of course, talk about the prevalence. We're going to talk about the ratios between boys and girls in terms of the, that prevalence. We're going to talk about influence of intellectual disability. And then lastly, the, the age of diagnosis, the typical age. So let's start with the, with the prevalence. And currently, based on the latest data, oh, and they looked at the data in 2022. So I know we're looking at 2025, but that, this is how it typically works. It's very similar to say cancer statistics. Whenever latest cancer stats are published, they usually are a few years back. And the reason why is because there's always a delay in order to collect accurate information. So this data, even though it will be known from now on as 2025, it actually comes from 2022 and so on. So the one from 2020 was also most likely delayed by a certain period of time. So based on that information in eight-year-olds, the prevalence was 32 kids out of every 1,000 children born in the United States were diagnosed with uh, autism, which translates to one in 31 children. So you can see massive increase. This is 22% increase over mere five years time span huge absolutely astonishing what is going on i have no clue like how can we be increasing having this dramatic increase in, in autism so that's kind of sad but it is it what it is and i can also tell you that this was uh, also not uniform throughout the country so for example the lowest rate was in texas and I believe this was maybe 10 children out of 1,000 children born. And the highest um, the highest um, record was in California. So California took the trophy for the worst outcomes. And you'll see, we'll see that again later on in, a, in the video as well. They got two worst trophies. So, and the reason why I say that is because their prevalence was 53 children diagnosed with autism out of every 1,000 newborns. And it also it was not equal amongst uh, ethnicities. So, for example, the lowest rate was observed amongst whites. And I believe this was hmm, maybe something like 28 out of 1,000 children. And the highest was amongst, um, the highest was amongst the, um, well, this was a surprise to me, it was amongst the Asians and um, and Pacific Islanders. I did not expect that ethnicity to be the most affected one. So that was a, a surprise. Now, before you start uh, saying white privilege, let me tell you something interesting, because <laughs> there is some truth to that. Uh, until 2016, it was in fact white people whose children were diagnosed with the highest rate of autism, as well as those from the highest social economic uh, status class. Okay, S since then, of course, other eth ethnic groups started to receive similar attention. And it wasn't until 2020 that finally other ethnic groups overtook white population in terms of rate of autism being diagnosed amongst people. And that was underrepresented groups, mainly blacks and Hispanics. So that's, that's the background. So, and now, while other uh, ethnicities might have higher prevalence, the question is then why, why is it now higher in, in uh, other ethnicities than the whites when it used to be different? They, well, clearly we have same maybe level of diagnosis amongst all ethnicities, but what is it about one group of people that you see, you see less of a prevalence of autism than others. And that could be 
indeed due to um, socioeconomic factors, etc. So, at, uh, and remember, I was saying, I do believe that there are significant environmental factors playing a role here. So it is possible that other ethnicities are exposed, more likely exposed to these unfortunate environmental factors. Now let's move forward. Let's talk about that suspected autism. And this was for every 10 children that were diagnosed with autism, there was one suspected case of autism in four-year-olds. So for every 10, 10 children that were eight-year-old with autism, there would be one four-year-old with suspected autism. So that's your overall prevalence amongst uh, the population, amongst different areas of the US and ethnicities. Let's talk about the ratio of boy to girl ratio. And that was 3.2 times more likely to observe autism amongst, amongst boys than girls, which uh, might sound dramatic. However, that ratio used to actually be even higher. So in 2018, this article reminds us that ratio was um, over four, maybe it was something like 4.2. I can't remember the exact number, but what this tells us is that not only is autism more frequently diagnosed amongst our children in that time, five year time span that we, we've had, it also is now more frequently observed in girls and hence that ratio between girls and boys is diminishing. Now, obviously boys have some biological reason as to why they're more, more predisposed to be diagnosed than girls. I never studied that, I'm a bit curious, but it's either they're more susceptible to whatever that environmental insult is, or girls have a better protective mechanism once encountering the, the insult. So whatever that might be, I, I'm sure there's some scientific literature on that topic. I probably should check it out at some point. So that's the, that is the ratio. We're going to now move on to the intellectual disability. And that's defined, by the way, by IQ, score of 70 or lower and 40 percent of all children with autism were diagnosed with uh, intellectual disability as well and this also varied between ethnicities and blacks had the highest level with 53 percent and and this was really interesting as well the lowest was amongst mixed ethnicities with i think it was something like 31% uh, rate, which the lesson here is perhaps that racism is dumb. <laughs> so uh, there, it, it, it pays, I guess, in terms of autism and intellectual disability to have mixed children. Now, moving forward, last one is the age of diagnosis and the median age for the entire country was 47 months. But again, this differed between different locations of the US. The, and here is once again where California took the top spot. There, they diagnosed their children on average, median, I should say, at 36 months compared to the national average. So something about California, either they have the best programs in the United States that faithfully and very accurately captures this information or they have the worst environmental conditions that could be contributing to autism or maybe a combination of those two. Something about California. And then once again, Texas had the latest age of diagnosis at 70 months. So that's the summary of this brief uh, summary of this article. I thought I'd give you an update because clearly this is also an area of, of interest to me to some degree. Uh, one more thing that I'll mention that at the time that this article came out, this is already at least a couple months ago, the leading organizations that, um, that um, support parents with uh, children with autism, they released a joint statement together. And what I found interesting is that they made three 
main points in that joint statement. What I found is surprising is that the top one, the biggest one, most important one for them was that vaccines do not cause autism. The reason why I find that surprising is because of their second statement, which I would think would be the most important, which is the fact that children with ASD deserve respect and support. To me, that would be the priority. Now, in terms of vaccines, it's true that there has never been association made between vaccines, any vaccine and autism. But one area that hasn't been properly explored, in my opinion, is the combination of cumulative effect of vaccines and autism. And the reason why I bring it up is not to mention that any of these vaccines together could be causing it, but because of this proposed theory in scientific literature that it could be adjuvants inside vaccines that could be the contributing factor because of aluminum. I made a video on this and I thought this was really credibly sounding hypothesis and I think we should be investigating this. So check that out uh, as well. I can also tell you that I did a video that looked at really interesting data that looked at how money is spent on vaccines via Medicaid and the future outcomes afterwards. So check that out, that's available on Patreon. And the reason why I'm bringing it up, oh, and the last point that these guys, uh, this, this group of organizations mentioned is that policies should always be driven by, by proper science, something to that extent. And I agree with that. But I will also mention in, in that my recent video dedicated to pandemic origins, I also talked about variety of ways how authorities troll the public in terms of using science to potentially mislead the public. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that is one example is using absence of evidence as evidence of absence, meaning that oftentimes we are told, no, 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 this is, this is not, there is no link between this and this. But what we are not told as the public is that the reason why there is no link is because this has never been studied. So we simply don't know whether there is a link or not because we never looked at that information as opposed to we looked at that information and we clearly established there is no link between the between the events. So sometimes we can be trolled like this. And I think this is the reason why we should be investigating every single possibility as to why we have this continuous rise in autism amongst ch children in, in the United States and likely very similar pattern as observed in Canada. All right, traffic is getting busy. So I'm gonna wrap it up here anyway. Please like, please share, please subscribe if you haven't already. This is how we grow, obviously. Leave a comment what you think. I know this is somewhat of a controversial topic. And also check out my Patreon account. I mentioned I had a video there. Some of the content on Patreon is free. Some of it is paid. And if you're supporting Patreon, you get to not only access everything, but you also get to help decide as to what content ends up on YouTube. Uh, eventually as well. All right, that's all I'm gonna have for today and I will see you guys in the next installment. Bye everyone.